Dave Williams is an um, astronomy researcher, uh, astrogeology researcher. You, you sent me your bio, of course, I'm with you. Uh, at ASU. He spoke to us here a couple months ago on roving the solar system. And today we're just going to solar system exploration, mm -hmm. recent results from NASA missions. Yep. So thanks very much for coming out, David. Okay, yeah, my pleasure. Um, I'm also a member of the Phoenix chapter, so I always like to, to come and, and talk. So the topic I'm, I'm calling this Exploring the Solar System, Recent Results from NASA Missions. And um, I, I, I put in some background material because I made a version of this talk for the Phoenix Comic Con that happened just a couple weeks ago. So some of this, you know, you guys are probably all well versed in this, but I'll, I'll just go through it anyway rather quickly. Why do we explore? Why do we want to explore space? There's a whole variety of reasons. Science, we want to understand the cosmos. And I use cosmos because there was a TV series that Neil deGrasse Tyson just, uh, I think it just had his last episode recently. Uh, we want to understand why the universe is the way that it is. National prestige, great nations undertake great things. And arguably one of the greatest things the United States ever did was to send humans to the surface of the moon multiple times and bring them back safely. Security, maintain the high ground, protection from adversaries. In a growing society where we're having more international competitor uh, nations, everybody is looking towards space. We want to be up there uh, for national security reasons. Economics, identify and exploit space resources to enhance the national economy. There's a whole variety of materials that exist on the moon, on the uh, near-Earth asteroids, and even in the outer solar system that could be uh, useful for sustaining a uh, spacefaring civilization. That links into sustainability, develop new technology to be better preserve Earth and its citizens. With a growing planetary population, uh, no matter how good you are at recycling and, and sustainability reusability, you're still going to have to go after new resources. Education and inspiration, inspire and create the next generation of scientists and engineers. This is so very important, we are coming uh, into an increasingly technical society dominated by science and engineering and the general public needs to be as well educated in this as we can possibly make them. Survivability, transform humanity into a multi-planet species. The reason why the dinosaurs aren't around is because they didn't have a space program. They didn't have the ability to deflect asteroids. We do. We can develop that capability. And so all these reasons together I think is why we want to continue to explore space. Now, NASA, our National Space uh, Organization, has a role in exploration, of course. Uh, for those of you who have ever wondered about how NASA is organized, that's what the purpose of this slide is. NASA has four what they call mission directorates. Aeronautics research deals with air transportation, so it helps out with uh, transporting uh, you know, aircraft all over the uh, uh, cargo and people all over the world. Space technology, developing the new technologies to better enable transportation in space. Science, the Science Mission Directorate, which is the one that I'll spend more time on because that's what I'm affiliated with. And then Human Exploration and Operations, and this is what supervises the Space Shuttle, this is what supervises the International Space Station, and is making the plans for the follow-on vehicles. So, Science, NASA Science Mission Directorate is split, splits the universe into four specific divisions. The Heliophysics Division is focused on study of our Sun. The Earth Science Division is focused on study of the Earth. The Planetary Science Division, which you know, I am funded from, uh, d basically to study everything else in the solar system except the Earth and the Sun. And then the Astrophysics D Division is everything outside the solar system. So they do cosmology and all of that type of stuff. So how do we explore the solar system? Well, you might wonder why when you hear announcements about space missions, sometimes you hear announcements about flybys, other times you hear orbiters, other times you hear rovers. And it seems very haphazard, but there's actually a logical progression about how we explore the solar system with ro robotic spacecraft. We do what's oops, we do what's uh, let me go back right there. We are. We do what's technically possible, what we have the engineering skills to do. We do what's affordable, what we have the money to to spend to do, and then we do the easy things first. We accomplish them successfully. Then we do the more complex things, and this is the order, uh, going left to right as we go across here, of the different types of planetary missions. The easiest robotic thing to do is a flyby. You launch a spacecraft, flies by a planetary body, takes pictures, transmits data back. Next in difficulty is an orbiter. A spacecraft, you actually slow down, get into orbit around a planetary body, and when you're in orbit, you have consistent uh, conditions of lighting so that you can get your global data set, something that completely covers the surface. You can characterize a planet in the global context. So once you understand a planet from orbit, 
then you want to have a lander and you can land in a number of different ways. You can do a hard lander. That's just something that collects data as it goes down, but it smacks into the ground. All your instruments are broken. So that's not very good. You want to have something that soft lands. And so that's where you want to use parachutes or airbags or thrusters to slow down so your spacecraft lands on the surface and you can actually have your science instruments survive and take data all around there. So you've got data at one landing site, but then you see something on the horizon that you're interested in. And so you want to go over there. And in that case, you need mobility. And that's where rovers come in. And I talked about the different types of rovers that you can have, ones with wheels, ones with legs, ones that float, balloons, or airplanes, or things like that. The next thing you would like to do robotically is sample return. Collect samples of air or soil or rock or ice from another planet and robotically bring that back to the surface of the Earth where you can study it more effectively in our laboratories here. And then, of course, the hardest thing, most expensive to do, are the human missions. So here's our chart of solar system exploration as it stands right now. And you can see the different modes of exploration across the top. Here you see the major bodies of the solar system from Mercury all the way out to Pluto. And for the purpose of this talk, Pluto is a planet, no matter what the IAU says about that. <laughs> anyway, you can see everything's been obviously been dis discovered telescopically. We've had flybys among everything in the inner solar system, many of the bodies in the outer solar system except for Pluto, but we have a spacecraft called New Horizons, which is on its way there. It's going to be there next summer, just about a year from now. Uh, orbiters, uh, we've had orbiters around all of the inner planets. Uh, we've started to have orbiters around main belt asteroids. And uh, we are starting this year, our big mission will be uh, the first orbiter of a comet that will actually send a lander down to the surface. Um, and there's planning for different types of concepts for orbiters or orbiter-like missions to Europa, Uranus, and Ganymede. Uh, I mentioned those a little bit later. Landers, we've had uh, the Soviet Union had French-built uh, balloons. Uh, well, they've had landers on the surface of Venus. They've also had balloons uh, in the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, they've had ro uh, robotic landers on the moon, uh, of course the Viking on Mars, etc. We're also going to try and land on that comet this year. And the Huygens probe went along with the Cassini mission, landed on Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Rovers, balloons, uh, the Lunokhod rovers, the, the so sort of the Russian Constellation Prize for not getting to the moon first. They had a couple of teleoperated rovers on the moon back in the 70s. We've had the very successful Mars rover program that's culminated with Curiosity, which is on the surface now to talk about. Sample return, the Soviet Union had the robotic sample return from some of their Luna missions in the 70s. We've sampled near-Earth asteroid material, cometary material, uh, solar wind material. And then humans, of course, have only been on the surface of the moon. So the goal is to completely fill in this chart. Then we'll have completely explored the solar system. We can start living Star Trek and boldly go where no one has gone before. OK. Um, this is just a graph to let you know that in terms of robotic exploration, we had a really great period of time uh, in recent history. Um, let me go back here. I, I'm using a new laser pointer for the first time, so I have to get used to it. Uh, last decade here, you see we had lots of launches, the 1990s, 2000s, but we're, as we move into this decade, we're having far fewer uh, launches, and uh, we're not going to have much in the outer solar system. So there's been a reduced commitment to uh, solar system planetary exploration that mostly coincides with the recent economic downturn, so we're trying to turn that around right now. So let me show this movie here. I'm, I, I'm not a heliophysicist, so I, I don't study the sun myself. I'm a, I'm a geologist. But I just wanted to show one uh, movie just to demonstrate that we do have this program in the heliophysics division that launches these satellites to explore the sun. And the most recent version is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And uh, this is a movie, uh, this one came out in 2012. It's a U in the UV 304 angstrom's light. And it just shows you one of these uh, magnetic storms where hot material is coming off the surface of the sun and uh, they call it coronal rain material that falls back, and it falls back following the magnetic field lines. So here you see one of these, these big prominences uh, coming off the surface of the sun, and in a minute they're going to show a, a scale, uh, show what the Earth size uh, is to this. So, and they got a little music. I, I, I can hear the music's coming through in the background. Didn't they have one of these? What? Yeah, see, there's the Earth to scale. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact length of time that this is actually running. I'm sure, I'm sure this is, yeah, over a longer period. And so it's just been compressed over here. 
Yeah, yeah, Chuck. Did it, didn't they have a major storm that kind of blew crap out right towards us? It, it happens all the time. Yeah, they they have these these storms periodically, and occasionally it makes it in the news. I, I I tend not to follow it. But Hasn't it like shut down the East Coast at one point back in the '30s or something? I don't know if I'd go so far as to say shut it down, but it can disrupt uh, telecommunications when you have major storms like this. Sparks were flying off telegraph lines. Interesting. That cannot even happen now in deep duty. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's uh, start our tour of the solar system. We'll start at the planet Mercury, and NASA has the first orbiter of the planet Mercury called Messenger, and that's what that acronym stands for, right up here. Here's the, what the spacecraft looks like. It has a very strong sunshade that protects the science instruments because you're so close to the sun at Mercury, you would burn out your instruments. And it arrived at Mercury after doing uh, several flybys. It arrived at Mercury in March of 2011, and it's just about ready to finish up its mission. I think the mission is, it gets over with uh, later this year. But um, here's a global view of Mercury from the Messenger spacecraft, and this is false color. So. This isn't what it really looks like. This is just putting the wavelengths of light together to show you the compositional differences. But you see the fresh craters here uh, with their rays. You see some of the dark blues of the ejecta, and you see some of the yellows color here. Here's the Caloris impact basin, about 1,000 kilometers in diameter. And these yellow colors up here are smooth plains. These are ancient volcanic lava flows that filled in the craters on the surface there. So the eruptions that occurred on Mercury, like the moon, were billions of years ago. Maybe the most recent one, but maybe about one billion years ago. But Mercury is very interesting. It has a large iron core. It is very iron depleted in its crust. It's very magnesium rich. Uh, there's been identified water ice in permanently shadowed regions of the craters at the poles of Mercury. That was finally confirmed in November of 2012. This is a graph that shows the elemental composition of mercury, and you can see here the mercury rocks are very different from Earth's mantle rocks, from Earth's crustal rocks, from the rocks of Mars and the rocks of the moon. So, you know, but just looking at, at this, we can determine uh, that it is, it looks very similar to the moon, but is very different in its composition. And um, here's a view of the, of the North Pole of mercury. And you can see this is, this is color coded for elevation now. So this is high elevation here. Blues are low elevation, forming in ancient impact craters and things. And this is the area that's been filled in by some of the lava flows. This view here shows you uh, these whitish spots around pits there. They call them uh, hollows on Mercury. This is where some sort of a sulfurish volatile gas was released uh, in ancient times. And it just produces this bright halo around some of these pits. So. Messenger's been very productive, uh, very good spacecraft, but it's near the end of its life. And the next mission is a European mission called Bepi Colombo that I think is supposed to launch around 2015 or 16. It'll also be an orbiter mission. So we move out to the planet Venus, uh, Earth's uh, twin in size and mass, but in terms of temperature and atmosphere and surface conditions, it's very, very different. It was very well mapped by the Magellan mission, which was there between 1989 and 1994, used radar to map the surface. The current mission that's there is a European mission called Venus Express. It's been there since 2006. Its fo main focus is to study the atmosphere. However, it's got a, uh, uh, made an interesting discovery that was announced a few years ago. They have an instrument that detects thermal signatures uh, from the surface. And here you see a movie that's flying around this volcano here. And it's color-coded in radar data for roughness. So dark is very smooth, bright is, bright is very rough. And you can see a, a volcano with lava flows coming off of it. And then when they superimpose the data from Venus Express, the color data, you can see it's very bright, yellows and oranges right here. And it coincides with the top of the volcano. And so what that means is that material is relatively warm uh, compared to the surrounding conditions and uh, that this is probably a sign of active volcanism sometime in geologi re geologically recent times. And when recent, we're talking millions to tens of millions of years. So stopping by the Earth, here's a nice view of the Earth, and this is just to show that NASA's Earth Science Division has a whole string of satellites that study the Earth. They study the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the clouds, the surfaces, the changing uh, vegetation coverage carbon dioxide pollution. There's a new mission that's going to be launching the 
uh, orbital carbon observatory two to replace one that that failed to lift off before. Uh, so all sorts of things are going on there, which I don't know anything about, but I just wanted to mention it. So uh, this is a slide, and the movie doesn't usually work, but this is just to remind us that he, even here on Earth, we get these close flybys of asteroids, and we all remember the um, was it 2012 uh, DA-14 flyby that occurred at the same time as the Chelyabinsk meteorite exploded over Russia? That was in, on Feb when February of uh, 2013. Well, we had one occur this year. Uh, this flyby occurred on February 10th, and it was about 11 times the Earth-Moon distance. So not, not very close compared to others, but um, f about 400 meters long, 200 meter long uh, 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 asteroid. Uh, so, you know, it's, these things happen continuously, and NASA has a whole program, it has a near-Earth observing program that's trying to catalog all of these decent-sized near-Earth objects so we can determine their orbits, that way if there's a collision coming, we're going to know about it, you know, well in advance. So, as we're talking about as we head to the moon, we should probably mention the uh, most recent uh, mission to go there was the Chinese, the People's Republic of China had a lander and a rover that was on the surface that landed in December of last year. And there you can see the, the rover view of the lander and the lander view of the rover with the, the Chinese flag on it. Um, it lasted a couple of cycles. It did rove on the surface for a while, but then it had a, a mechanical failure. They're still getting signals from the U-2 uh, rover, but it's not moving right now. So that mission is probably all, all completed. And, Here's uh, an image from our camera, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera uh, that we operate at ASU. And there you can see that point that's flashing in and out. That's where we imaged after it landed on the surface. So um, there's, there's been a whole flotilla of missions from different countries sent to the moon over the last 15 years to characterize quite a variety of things. This is from a NASA instrument called the Moon Mineralogical Mapper that was on the Indian uh, lunar orbiter, Chandrayaan-1. And it's color-coded here, and this is basically water abundance. And I don't mean liquid water, but water that's been bound into the mineral structures here. And so, uh, contrary to what was believed for many years, there's uh, water being implanted by the solar wind into the lunar soils, and it can migrate up to cold traps uh, that you have in the polar regions. And here's a view from another NASA instrument. This was a radar, synthetic aperture radar, that was also on the Indian mission. And this one was looking at the abundance of water ice in the permanently shadowed regions of craters at the lunar poles. And their result was probably about 608 million metric tons of water ice exist up at both the North Pole and probably a similar amount down at the South Pole in the craters there. So this is an excellent resource that if we ever send humans to the surface, yes? Yeah, you said that one of the water was on the near side. Uh, how much difference is it to the far side? That's a good question. I don't know. I haven't seen a corresponding map of the far side, but if it's being implanted by the sun, if you're getting some water or, or hydroxyls being implanted by solar wind, of course, the moon rotates and e it gets equal amount of sunlight. So that means the far side should have about the same amount. So how long ago it was there because the Earth's gravity pulls the near side out? Uh, perhaps a little bit, yeah, but I think that if, if it's something that's being implanted by the sun, it's going to, to be continued to be accumulated in the lunar soil at an equal rate. Mm -hmm. Say again, that 608 metric, a million metric tons, is that on, on each pole, you're saying? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a About that amount at each pole, yeah. So you're going to have, in the permanently shadowed regions of craters, you're going to have this water ice, and it's covered by a layer of regolith, which preserves it. And then since no sunlight hits it, that's what allows it to be preserved. And, you know, it's, it's just accumulated there over the history of the moon. That's, that's my understanding. That, that's more equal than in past estimates, if the estimate is the same for... Yeah. What, what Paul Spudis, who is the PI on this instrument, said, that was the number that he published for the North Pole. And it, at last year at the Planetary Conference in Houston, he said, he, he basically said exactly what I said, and about a comparable amount oh, at the oh, South okay. Pole. Right. He didn't say an exact number. So, okay. and if that's Paul's number, it's a good number. Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This is a NASA mission. It's been uh, orbiting the moon since 2009. And uh, here's, it shows you the instruments on a diagram of the spacecraft. And we at ASU 
are in charge of the camera, not me personally, but Professor Mark Robinson and his group. And here you see a movie of the moon as you go from the near side that we see from Earth. There's the Orientale Basin. Here's the far side, the South Polakan Basin. And we're going to switch to a color view for surface topography. So there you see the low of the South Polakan Basin, the high, the high topography of the lunar far side. Here you start to see the craters. Now you're coming around the near side again. So you have the Chrysium Basin here. Uh, right here, and there's Imbrium Serenitatis, so uh, Apollo 11 landed over there, Oceanus Procolarum. These are all giant impact basins that have been filled by uh, lava flows. Now we're coming around uh, Orientale again and in the far side. So you see the thicker far side highland crust. The idea is, is that uh, giant impacts excavated the near side crust that then allowed them to fill with these dense uh, titanium iron rich lavas that erupt from the interior. And, uh, you know, there's been a whole host of theories to, to add more detail to this expl explanation. Like the most recent one that was just published in the last couple of weeks was that, you know, because the near side was locked to the earth such that it, 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 it was able to, uh, it wasn't able to cool as quickly as the far side. So, you know, the crust was able to, to form much thicker on the far side. But this is just an example of some of the data sets that we're able to produce from these, these orbiter missions that allow you to characterize the global geology of one of these bodies. Here's a great image. This is the crater Giordano Bruno on the uh, far side, 22 kilometers in diameter. Anybody remember the first episode of Cosmos? Uh, yeah, he talked about Giordano Bruno. I actually didn't know all that about him, so I learned something there in that first episode. But here you see this texture on the floor here. It sort of looks a little bit like lava flows, but that's actually impact melt. And when you have an impact into a planetary surface, you put down so much heat, it melts the target material into stuff that can, that can actually flow. And you can actually have material that looks like lava flows, but it's not because it's the same composition of the target material. And so we call that impact melt. So uh, we've had a couple of other lunar missions happen just within the last couple of years. This one called LADEE, Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, that actually operated for just a year. That was designed to measure the lofted lunar dust that comes off of the surface whenever there's any activity on the surface. Um, so when the Chinese mission landed, it was looking to see if it detected any uh, amount of dust. I don't think that they found anything major. It also did a technology test for uh, optical laser communications from the Earth to the Moon which I've heard was successful. Mm -hmm. that, wasn't that mission supposed to look for that, you know, Terminator dust phenomenon? That... I think so, yeah. I haven't heard anything one way or another. Yeah, I haven't heard anything either. I, 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 haven't, I haven't been looking for it, which is my... Either, but I would have thought yeah. it come up in the... It's probably in the literature somewhere, uh, at least in abstract form, yeah, yeah for, for one of these conferences. Uh, the other recent mission we had was called GRAIL, and this is where you had a pair of lunar orbiters flying in close precision to map the gravity field of the moon at a higher detail than ever before. And here's my favorite result from that particular mission. Uh, these graphs uh, you see here, uh, views of the moon, you see these dark blue lines there? Those are actually areas of density contrast where you have dense material, and we think those are fractures that have been filled by dense mare lavas, and this is how the lavas got out onto the surface of the moon. You had impacts that fractured the lunar crust, and then they filled with these dense lavas. And you know, here's an Earth example of something like that. This is Shiprock in, in New Mexico. This is the eroded neck or core of a volcano. All the material around it's eroded away, but this was the feeder dike that's, that you also see exposed over here. So you see something similar in some of these, these blue lines here. You see areas where areas were filled by, by lavas and then these feeders that brought the material to the surface. So let's head on out as we move. Uh, before we get to Mars, we'll stop at, at, and talk a little bit about some of the, the asteroids and comets uh, that have been explored. These are all the asteroids that have been visited by spacecraft prior to dawn's arrival at Vesta. These down here are all the comets that have been explored. So you see they're very irregular, rocky bodies there. You see craters. You might see evidence of some linear features on the surface. Uh, very, very irregular. But we got our first close-up look at one of the main belt asteroids when the Dawn spacecraft got to Vesta. And it was at Vesta between uh, 2011 and September 2012. It's on its way to Ceres. will be there for a couple of years. So um, the goal of this particular mission was to characterize the two largest main belt asteroids. And they're very, very different. Ceres, uh, uh, these are the Hubble Space Telescope views. 
Uh, Ceres is large, it's, it's circular, and it appears to have the signature of water ice, whereas Vesta is irregular and appears to be very dry. It's, it has the spectral signature of a type of meteorite we find on Earth. We call them HED meteorites, and they appear to have basaltic lava flow materials mixed into them. So that means that this, even though it's smaller, it was able to differentiate or separate into a crust, mantle, and core. So here's the best uh, Hubble movie. This is a Vesta. This is before Dawn got there. So you see, it's got dark stuff and bright stuff, but you don't know what it means. And now this is the view that we got from uh, the Dawn mission as we approached in orbit. So you see there, um, it's very irregular, and that's because at the bottom there, there was actually two giant impacts at the bottom that blew out the material to produce those HED meteorites. But you do see these equatorial ridges cutting across here. You see areas where you have bright material. You see the bright, fresh craters. There's actually dark material, dark splotches on the surface. Uh, we think our craters, here's those equatorial ridges. And that, we've determined that that actually is a, is a tectonic response to the formation of one of the big basins at the South Pole. There's also some uh, ridges up north. And this part here, this is part of the original crust of Vesta that was actually uh, preserved on the surface. So you can see all this up close on any of these four posters here, because the four different views of, of Vesta. So on a, the Dawn is on its way. It's using its ion propulsion. It has ion propulsion, and it's using that. It used that to get to Vesta, and now it's on its way to Ceres. And uh, you know, a neat discovery that was announced was water vapor coming off of Ceres. And this was from this was announced in January of this year. So this is a, actually relatively fresh. The European Herschel Space Telescope detected water molecules escaping from two specific regions of Ceres at a rate of about six kilograms per second. It was detected when Ceres was closer to the sun, which means it was warmer. So the idea is that it's either buried cometary ice or what's something we call cryovolcanism. Cryovolcanism is when you have water mixed with some form of antifreeze like ammonia or methane, and it behaves more like a solid slushy material. And so it's sort of like, uh, it behaves like lava flows on Earth, except it's very, very cold and it's, it's not silicate, it's something else. So we call that cryovolcanism. So these are two main possibilities, and we'll be able to investigate that when Dawn gets there. And the, the arrival date is March 23rd of next year. So we shall see about that. So the other thing going on with uh, small bodies, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the Ros European Rosetta mission. This is going to be a comet orbiter and lander. It's going to go to this comet with the Russian names I can't pronounce. And it's going to arrive in August, so just about a month to two months from now and it's going to deliver a German lander in November. The idea is to study this comet nucleus and environment for two years as the comet gets closer to the sun and starts to develop a coma and tail and see how it actually changes. So let's go to Mars. And uh, Mars, here's one of my favorite things that I've made here. This is, this is Olympus Mons. It's the largest shield volcano in the solar system. And you can see I superimposed the Arizona border. So you have one volcano the size of Arizona. This is the collapsed crater, the caldera at the top of the volcano. And over here, I've superimposed the map of Phoenix. So you can fit the entire Phoenix metropolitan area in the caldera at the top of the volcano. Um, so this is from the mission I worked on, HRSC, the German stereo camera on Mars Express, and this is just a picture of the poster here. It's a double-sided poster you can take home and get facts about the mission. Uh, here's some views. This is a view of the Gale Crater. This was the landing site of the Curiosity rover, and you can see it's color-coded for topography over the actual geology. And this is the uh, mountain that is going to be studied as the rover goes up, up the hill about that. Um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, this is uh, a NASA mission. It's been there since uh, 2006. It's got this camera, high rise that's operated by Professor Alfred McEwen and his staff at the University of Arizona down in Tucson. It can measure things the size of beach balls on the surface. Here's this view of Curiosity landing. So the rover was actually still in the back shell, but here you see the deployed parachute. So I like it because you had one robotic spacecraft orbiting Mars taking a picture of another robotic spacecraft in the process of landing on Mars. So this was all done by remote, no control from Earth. Um, here's a little movie. This is just showing the parachute blowing in the winds uh, on the surface of Mars after the Curiosity rover landed, which is kind of neat. Um, Here's a movie. Uh, this is also one from High Rise showing a dust devil. You know, we see a dust devils in the Arizona desert all the time. This one is 12 miles high, and it's the main mechanism for taking dust off the surface of Mars and depositing it in the atmosphere that then can settle back down on the surface. 
Um, another thing of interest on Mars uh, over the last, you know, quite a few years is understanding these what look like to be fresh gullies on the surface. These things appear and disappear quite regularly. And uh, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms that have been proposed for this. Don't bother reading this, but what this is saying is that some of these gullies are probably formed by dry granular flow, just you know, material coming down by the source of gravity. But there are others that we think are formed by very briny, salt-rich water that erupts outside at the tops of crater rims and then full, goes down to form these features. And here you see a time-lapse movie of some of this where this material will come out. Liquid water is not stable, of course, on the surface of Mars. It, it will very quickly bubble, bubble away, but it may exist long enough to bring small material down to form some of these gully-type features on the surface. And um, here's a, a still image showing another one of these types of tracks here where it goes downhill. Um, they occur on quite a few different locations on the surface. So it's, it's, it, it, it seems to be a quite a common phenomenon. Um, another thing, this is the great thing you have, since we've had the surface of Mars under continuous surveillance since about 1996 with the various Mars orbiters, we are able to see surface changes, and, and including when you have fresh impact craters. And this is an example where you have impact that is excavated down and exposed ice. So underneath the rock um, and the dust, if you go down uh, for most of the surface from the North Pole down to the mid-latitudes, you're going to be able to expose ice that then quickly sublimates away. So we see that also in quite a few areas uh, of the surface. And the blue is where we've actually seen exposed ice that is later sublimated on the, away on the surface. So uh, let's talk about the rovers. There were two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, that landed in 2004. Spirit died in 2010. Opportunity is to this day still exploring the surface of Mars. Um, it had a major discovery in January. It found a location that confirmed the existence of clay minerals, which were indicative of a past habitable environment something that was also found by Curiosity, and I'll talk more about that. We've had telescopic observation of what we think is methane at specific locations in the Martian atmosphere that is time varying. This is a very controversial detection. They think it might be due to contamination from Earth's atmosphere. The Curiosity rover landed and it did its first assessment looking for methane, did not find any evidence of methane. Methane, of course, could be produced geologically or biologically, so it's very, very important. Um, first uh, detection from, from Curiosity did not detect it, but they're going to continue to look as the mission goes on. Uh, so we all remember the Curiosity landing by the Sky Crane in August of 2012. Um, they had to do that because uh, Curiosity is much, much bigger than the other rovers there. It's the size of a Mini Cooper, weighs one ton. They didn't want to have it land, you know, and risk dust contaminating the geochemistry laboratory that's at the front of the rover. They figured out the best way to do it would be to keep the thrusters up high and then lower it on a tether, which is why they did the sky crane landing system there. So we all know it was a perfect 10, you know, perfect 10 in the landing there. That was during the last Summer Olympics, that cartoon. Um, the Mars rover Curiosity is not designed to detect life. Um, it's not designed to image microorganisms, but it can detect the organic molecules in rocks and soils, the isotopic composition of inorganic versus organic carbon, search for chemical and textural patterns indicative of biologic versus physical processes, because if you have microbes in there, they process the minerals that are in the rocks in a different way, producing different textures than what can be produced organically. So that's what the rover was designed to do. And during the first eight months after landing, it was basically commissioning all the different capabilities of the rover, testing the wheels, deploying the robot arm, taking the panoramas of the landing site. And it wasn't until February of 2013 that they actually used the drill. It has a percussion drill to powderize rock uh, and take that from the surface. You can see the difference between you know, the color of material on the surface versus stuff that's extracted. It's more grayish in color put that into the geochemistry laboratory and to do their analysis. And it turned out the place where it landed in Gale Crater was the site of an ancient river system or within an intermittently wet lake bed. The mineralogy indicates interaction with liquid water that was not too acidic, not too alkaline, low salinity. Theoretically, you could drink it if you had been there at the time, although I don't know if people would really want to take that chance. It had all of the chemical ingredients for life, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. 
So in, in a word, it was a habitable environment. At the time that that water was there, that those rocks were formed, it would have been habitable for life as we understand it. And this is just a diagram showing, you know, what they're probably like, this would have been the extent of the water at that particular location. Since then, uh, the Curiosity rover has continued to go down and explore, and it's getting ready to start going through this field here to start to climb up. And as it goes up, it's going to be looking at the different layers of rock. It's going to be going through Martian geologic time from older to younger and looking at how the, the rocks change and what it can tell us about the change in the environment. So here's another study. Uh, this is from a Martian meteorite. This is from February of this year. A particular Martian meteorite, it's a basaltic rock, 1.3 billion years old. It had impact ejected 12 million years ago off the surface of Mars, and it landed in Antarctica 5,000 years ago. It turns out it has curved microtunnels in clay minerals, and it has these carbon-enriched spirals here. And these features here are all indicative of interaction with microorganisms. So the idea is that this Martian meteorite might have had interaction with microbes uh, millions to billions of years ago on the surface of Mars. It's, it's not definitive, but it's very similar to features we see here produced by terrestrial microorganisms. So another interesting uh, piece of the puzzle of the story. So as Mike mentioned, there's the next Mars mission is a Mars orbiter called MAVEN, and this one is designed to understand why atmos Mars' atmosphere is so thin, what happened to all the water, where was it all lost, why was it all lost. It should get there this fall, October, November time frame there. So that's not really a geology mission, so I don't know that much more about it, but it's going to be interesting nonetheless. All right, let's jump to the outer solar system. We have a spacecraft on its way to Jupiter. This is a picture of it. It's called Juno. It's designed to be a Jupiter polar orbiter to study the atmosphere and the magnetosphere, and it will get there in 2016. Notice it has solar panels. Solar panel technology is, is advanced far enough that you can actually operate low power science instruments by solar energy as far away as Jupiter. So here's a picture. Uh, it did, uh, Juno did its Earth flyby in October of last year just to test the science instruments. And you can see here's the picture of Earth it took as it came by. So the instruments are working, so hopefully it will continue that way. It will get to Jupiter in 2016. So I mentioned about our long, the U.S. is the leader in exploration of the outer solar system. We went from one mission to another, from Pioneer to Voyager to Galileo to Cassini. And before each mission ended, we were well into the development of the follow-on mission. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened recently. And as, you get, as we get to the end of, say, 2017, all the outer planet missions will have ceased operating. Cassini will end, New Horizons will have done its Pluto flyby, Juno will end at Jupiter, and that's why we want to get the next outer planet mission going. And I'll tell you about the options for that. Our European colleagues have gone full bore, and they've created their first large flagship robotic mission. They call it the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE. And this is going to be a spacecraft that actually orbits Ganymede. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It's one of the Galilean satellites of Jupiter. It generates its own magnetic field. It probably has a thin liquid water layer deep in its interior. It's affected by the tidal heating of Jupiter. It's got very old terrain and very young terrain, but it's a very interesting body. And the overall goal of this is to study the Jovian system to understand the emergence of habitable worlds around gas giants because the icy moons of Jupiter all have liquid water in their interiors. NASA is contributing um, one instrument among the 11 instruments on this mission as well as personnel. So this solar-powered spacecraft would launch in 2022, arrive in 2030. So as far as NASA goes, we've been trying to get a mission going to Europa and it's been helped the situation a little bit because of this announcement in December, just this past December, that there appear to be geysers on Europa. The uh, Hubble Space Telescope has detected material venting from Europa when it's undergoing extension in its orbit about, uh, you know, between Jupiter and the Sun. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's very much helped to make the case that we should send a large robotic mission back to Jupiter to study Europa. This is our sweet uh, mission here called Europa Clipper. This would do much of the same type of thing. It wouldn't actually be a Europa orbiter because of the intense radiation. It would be a Jupiter orbiter that would do many, many flybys, but get global coverage of Europa through repeated flybys. And this is the one we're trying to get uh, approved through Congress. It's pretty pricey, but it's, 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 it's as cheap as it can get and still do the quality science 
that is consistent with all the other great flagship outer solar system missions that we've had. So we're going to keep pressing on this and uh, to see if we can get this approved and funded through uh, Congress and the administration. Let's go out to Saturn. The Cassini mission has been there since 2004. We're ending its uh, most recent mission extension here, and it's been proposed to extend it for a final three years uh, while the spacecraft still has fuel, and then to end the mission in 2017 with a very Juno-like mission, you know, like the Juno mission to Jupiter, very close studies of the atmosphere and magnetosphere of Saturn. And the advantage of being there so long is you can get to see all this great change on the surface. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the great results. Here's the polar hexagon, uh, the north polar region of Saturn there, and there's this unusual feature up there, and I have no idea why it's a uh, hexagonal shape. That's a big conundrum uh, that I think they're still trying to figure out, but it's very, very neat. Um, Saturn's moon Enceladus. Enceladus is actually smaller than Vesta, but it's got these water vapor geysers erupting from these fractures at the south pole. You can see the heat signature here, the geyser signature here. Um, they are much greater, the amount of energy output is much greater than would have been expected prior to our arrival there, so we're trying to understand that. That's also a great target for astrobiology interest. Here's uh, uh, Saturn's moon uh, Iapetus, dark on one side, bright on the other. A very clean ice here. There's this material that's dumped on the surface, and now we know the reason why. Our friends at Spitzer detected this ring of debris around Saturn that coincides with the orbit of the outermost moon Phoebe. We think it's a captured Kuiper belt object. So material from the solar wind impinges on Phoebe and it just knocks it down on the leading hemisphere of Iapetus. So that's a, that's a problem that's been solved now. Here's uh, Dione, another of the icy moons of Saturn there. And you can see this topography showing evidence of ridges. And what this is is warm icy crust, possible evidence of a subsurface ocean at the time of formation. Probably not now, these are pretty much dead worlds, but they did have geologic activity uh, long, long ago, many of these moons. Saturn's largest moon is Titan. It's the one that has the atmosphere of one and a half bars pressure of uh, nitrogen and methane. It has hydrocarbon lakes. Here's an ethane lake near the South Pole. You can see a feeder channel here. Here's Titan's Nile River, 400 kilometers long, feeding these lakes up in the North Polar region. Here's just a little video to show you the north polar region of Titan. And this is from the radar data. They use radar to penetrate the opaque atmosphere, just like we did for Magellan at Venus. And they see these dark areas on the surface. Since the radar can't penetrate them, they're probably liquid material. Because of the cold temperatures on the surface and lack of oxygen, it's probably hydrocarbon. So you see here, the spacecraft is going to dive down and look closely. So Kraken Mare is this big one here. And over there, and this is Lygia Mare. And uh, you can see it's darker in the interior, which is what you would expect if it's much deeper, and then it, it, this lighter blue indicates it's shallowing as you get closer to the, uh, the shallow end, uh, uh, just like you would see lakes on, on the Earth. But instead of lakes of liquid water, these are lakes of liquid hydrocarbon on the surface. You need oil? Methane and ethane. Ethane, okay. Yeah. With liquid natural gas. Liquid natural gas, yeah. And people will say, well, uh, isn't it dangerous? Couldn't the whole place go up in a giant flame? And the answer is no, because there's no oxygen there. You had to have oxygen to have fire. So this is, if a person is really interested in collecting hydrocarbon for whatever reason, this would be the place to do it. So we'll move on. And uh, I mentioned cryovolcanism. We look at, at the surface of Titan and we see these unusual features, a mountain with a crater with a lobate flow around the edge of it. That could be a cryovolcanic lava flow. Here you see these dark things here. Those are actually linear sand dunes and we see how that they actually will go around topographic obstacles here. So the winds on Titan are strong enough to blow this organic hydrocarbon particulate material to actually form dunes. We've actually seen it rain rain hydrocarbon on Titan and darken the soil just the way water darkens the ground on Earth when it rains. We see impact craters from fresh to degraded and filled in. And we've seen modification, we've seen changes in these lakes over time. Uh, indicate material is, it, it's an active cycle of hydrocarbon between 
the atmosphere, rain, flow, accumulation in lakes, sinking into the ground and then coming back up somehow into the atmosphere. So very, very interesting. We've made our first topographic map from radar data. And you can see here that blue at low elevation, this is the higher elevations down over here. You sort of a, extrapolate out from all of the various radar swaths and paths uh, on the surface. This was an announcement. Here's, a, here's one for you this year. Uh, the first rings around an asteroid, a centaur asteroid between the orbit of Jupiter and Neptune, uh, 250 kilometer diameter, it was actually detected that it has rings around it. Two rings, seven and 13 kilometers wide, partially uh, composed of water ice there. So if you thought that the that, that, that planets were the only things that could have rings, this shows you that, that the universe is even stranger than we thought. Okay, going back a little bit, mm -hmm. in Spitzer, I guess, is I'm not so much interested in Spitzer, but that might be shut down for funding. But as far as you were talking about fuel on Cassini, mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about maneuvering fuel versus the RTG. Uh, you, both are, are required there, yeah. But you, as time goes on, you start to lose your, you use up all your hydrazine and then you can't maneuver the spacecraft. And Cassini is really important because you need the hydrazine fuel to point the different instruments because the instruments are not on a scan platform like they were on Galileo. So you have to turn the spacecraft to it depending on what instrument you want to point at the time. So you have that and then the RTG does degrade. The amount of energy it generates does degrade over time. And so it launched in what, 96? And now we're approaching 2016, 20 years. So the lifetime of RTGs is usually, you know, like that. Well, the reason why I say I'm just concerned, I mean, it took a long time. And NSS was very involved in getting Cassini. I mean, I personally demonstrated outside the White House, which is a very strange thing to have NSS people out there. <laughs> but anyway, the, um, the interest, I mean, when, if you're saying that they're concerned about money, if, I mean, are they wanting to shut down at the end of this three next three-year period? Well, that, that, that's going to be the end of the mission. They're going to end the mission by a burn-up in Saturn's atmosphere well, in 2017. I mean, say if they're saying, oh, we just want to, again, like with Spitz, we're going to take out one observatory because we don't have the money. Yeah. Great. But if you've still got fuel yeah. to operate. That's the idea. Yeah, that's why every two years, all of NASA's missions that are, are in what they call extended mission, after you've completed your initial nominal mission and you still have, have resources to gather new data, you have to go through an extended mission review. And we've done that once, and, and, we, want to, and we need to do that again for Cassini so it can do its last three years of the plan. Of well, I think that's one where if somebody actually decides that they don't want it, that might be an NSS realm because the money is crazy. I mean, it's like if you wanted to shut down the second rover on Mars because, oh, we don't have money for it. That's dumb. <laughs> it is dumb. And those are all likely things that could happen depending on what the results of the senior review. All the, all the spacecraft are competing together in a senior review. They'll look at, you know, they, they know how much money it would take to continue to operate them and then it depends on how much money is in the budget. In the case of Cassini, since it's the only thing operating in the outer solar system, I don't think they'll cut that. I think that's pretty safe. Uh -huh. That's but that, because I mean, if you've got that you're there, it took years to get there. I mean, it'd be like, oh, let's just not turn on and get the data from the Pluto mission. Yeah. Well, no, yeah, they 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 would never do that. Not for an mission that's that's still gathering its pr its prime data. But uh, yeah, uh, that's where we're headed next. There's nothing at Uranus and Neptune. We're thinking about a Uranus orbiter mission, but it's very unclear whether money will materialize for that. But the Pluto mission, uh, you see right here, this is the New Horizons mission. This spacecraft is really small. It's the size of a baby grand piano launched on a very powerful rocket, which is why you went basically one month Earth to Mars orbit, one year Earth to Jupiter. And even with all that, it's just now getting close to Pluto. So it'll be there next year. And we tested the instruments. Here's when it did its Jupiter flyby. So this is my favorite. This is Io, the volcanic moon of Jupiter. Um, it, this is lit up in Jupiter shine here. So there you see Loki, one of the big volcanoes here. This is overexposed, but here's Tavashtar, one of the volcanoes up in the North Polar region, and it's erupting. You can see the gas and dust erupting in this plume that accumulates on the surface there. That's over about an, an eight minute span, I think. So here's what Pluto looks like from Hubble Space Telescope, bright areas and dark areas, but you, know, you still don't know what they mean. Pluto will transform. New Horizons will transform Pluto from an astronomical object into a geological object when it does its flyby. So I'm just going to quickly glance through, now that we're at the edge of the solar system, 
The Kepler mission has been very, very uh, popular uh, to discover extrasolar planets, and we've detected uh, Earth-sized extrasolar planets in habitable zones, the regions where liquid water would be stable on the surface. There's been many of these. Uh, they've been more announcements over the course of the last few years. Uh, October of 2013, the first Earth-sized exoplanet was, was announced. Of course, this one was you know, way too hot. But uh, the first Earth-sized exoplanet in a habitable zone was just announced in April of this year. So here you see one that's similar in size of Earth in a location where liquid water could be stable. So, you know, Kepler is the gift that keeps on giving. There's a lot of data that was returned that needs to be studied. This one is just from earlier this month. Kepler, uh, super rocky, uh, supersized rocky exoplanet, 17 times the weight of Earth, 2.3 times the size. Models say it should be gas, but isn't. So also not a place where life could exist, but very, very strange and interesting. So. Uh, Earth-sized exoplanet found around Alpha Centauri. So here's the upcoming Mars mission. This is going to be the next launch. It's going to be InSight. This is going to be a Mars geophysical lander that will deploy a seismometer and a heat flow probe to image the interior of Mars, understand what's going on inside. Uh, the next medium-sized mission is called OSIRIS-REx. Here's what it stands for. This is going to be a near-Earth uh, asteroid orbiter dock collect samples, and return the samples to Earth. This is run by the University of Arizona down in Tucson. ASU is building the imaging instrument for this. This is going to go to a near-Earth carbonaceous asteroid, very, very primitive material, collect material from it in 2020, and then return the samples to Earth in 2023. So we're all, every, people are, at both ASU and U of A are very, very busy on this particular mission. Um, you probably heard about this in 2003. This was the Obama administration's alternative uh, suggestion of something to do instead of going back to, to, to the moon, which was from the, proposed by the previous administration about basically an asteroid redirect. You send a uh, robotic spacecraft to a near-Earth asteroid, and you basically capture it, and you redirect it back to Earth, uh, near-Earth space, lunar orbit or something where the astronauts can then grab samples, collect samples, and learn how to operate with uh, these small bodies, which is important if you're going to be doing uh, mining and, and working with space resources somewhere in the future. However, most of the scientific community isn't very in favor of this particular uh, mission concept. Uh, they, uh, most of my colleagues, just to the best of my knowledge, would be more interested in going to the moon as a test bed before going to Mars, where you can test the scientific equipment and techniques on the moon that you're going to need when you send humans to the surface of Mars. So, but this is still a, a neat movie that shows you their concept about grabbing, putting something around to grab an asteroid, and using, this is a solar electric ion propulsion module that will slowly bring it back to near Earth space in some way. So, as in the interest of time, I'm not going to watch the whole movie. You can download all of this stuff from, from NASA's uh, website there. But. Anyway, uh, we're continuing to fight the good fight for planetary science funding. The uh, Obama administration had cut the budget uh, you know, every year, 2013, 14, 15, and with the help of the Planetary Society and other organizations, we've managed to get most of that funding put back in. So we'll see what the funding is for 15. But uh, it's been a real challenge uh, to, to operate with uh, the last couple of years. So I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Any specific questions? Yeah, Mike? I, I've always thought it would be really cool at Cassini end of mission to put it in a co-orbit with the rings. Mm. Is that even feasible? No, based on what I know for the Cassini mission, um, the amount of fuel left on board and the degradation in the RTGs is such that the mission won't, they won't be able to do anything with it past 2017. So they thought the best way, to, uh, and they, they, they want to dispose of the spacecraft. Right. And the way they, they've chosen to dispose of it is to let it burn up in Saturn's atmosphere. So that's why the, the end of mission scenario is to do, uh, I don't know, 10 or so close flybys. You go closer and closer to Saturn within the, you know, below the rings, and you're going to study the atmosphere in each flyby the same way that Juno is going to do at Jupiter. So then you have two data points uh, looking at, at the atmospheres of these gas giant planets that way. And I think the concern would be, you know, it could easily get damaged 
from ring material. Mm -hmm. Well, that would no make control. another ring. <laughs> yeah. Then you've got that thing sitting there, no control. Yeah. But I, I, I just thought that would have been an interesting. Where, where a spacecraft continue, can function um, in a circumstance like that, then they would do that. For example, after the, we exhaust the hydrazine fuel on the Dawn spacecraft, which is the limiting factor on that, once it gets into orbit of series, you know, they, they, they are going to put that into an orbit that should be 50 years stable around, around series. So, other questions? <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you know anything of the results, the kind of information that came from the X-ray fluorescence spectrometers on the Viking landers. Um, you're referring to the, the, life, the search for life experiments? No, the ones that were for elemental analysis of soils. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the specific details. That was a bit before my time as a scientist. Um, the Viking landings, I, I was uh, a child when those actually occurred. but. The party line is on that, that, you know, we analyzed the soil and it was distinctly different than what they expected. There's these perchlorates and other material that make the chemistry very reactive. Um, and so it wasn't quite what we expected. If, in, in the simplest terms, the soil of, of Mars is basically a basaltic type of rock with variations. You find, uh, you know, in some places you find sulfur and, and other things in, in varying quantities of it, but it was just very, very different than I think what the instruments at the time were optimized for. And that's become clear with later missions, you know, if, if for example, in the search for life, you know, the two of the three Viking lander experience to search for life yielded positive results, but positive in the context of what they expected. And you know, they didn't take into account this unusually reactive soil. And, they, and it's because of that, they said, well, organic material cannot exist you know, with the solar bombardment on the surface of Mars. Any type of organic material would have to be deeper down that would be protected from the solar radiation impingement on the surface of Mars. So that's where you need to have a drill or something to access something at, at depth to, to study and look for that. So that's, that's about all I know on that. Mm -hmm. You uh, didn't mention that there's a full-size replica of the, lunar, of, of the Mars lander. That's at ASU? Yeah, and our new building at ASU. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a it's a model of the Curiosity rover full-size. And there's a full-size model of Spirit and Opportunity in the Mars Space Flight Facility, Phil Christensen's lab in the Moore Building on the Tempe campus. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. I was struck by a couple of things you showed today for me. Uh, one of them was the, the presence of ice on Mercury. I wouldn't have suspected that that would be possible. Is it because Mercury has a tilt that that's a permanently shadow? Is that what caused it? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's because of the fact that in crater rims, you, you have some sort of shielding from solar radiation and, and that you can create these permanently shadowed zones, and that's where any uh, water ice, somehow this material, these, these molecules migrate along the surface and toward cold traps and they accumulate in these cold traps and then as over geologic time as dust accumulates it protects them but it's, there's still enough of it in abundance in these locations that are protected from solar radiation that they can then be detected by other types of remote sensing instruments like the radar. Interesting. Uh, the other question I have is on the um, asteroid that has the Looks like two tracks orbiting it. Yeah, best up. Mm -hmm. What's the mechanism there? It's not uh, a um, gravitational effect, is it? Is it st electrostatic? No, but the idea is, and uh, this is the poster that shows the. Uh, the equatorial ridges and troughs here. The idea is, is that there was a large impact down here and of course you propagate energy not only through the interior but also along the surface and the models that I've seen is that you're going to have uh, surface waves going along and at this particular location along basically the equator you're going to have a series of grobbins produced, you know, up and down drop blocks and they basically occur all the way along except over the part where you have the thicker crust and that's this poster right here. This is Vestalia Terra, and the, uh, the equatorial graben basically don't come up onto this part of it here, or on this part here where we have the, the, the snowman type of craters. So you see there's some up here, 
This is from an older impact, also offset at the South Pole, and it caused a similar type of thing up in the northern terrain here. But yeah, those equatorial ridges go all the way across except over this piece of the original crust, which is preserved. Yeah, it's a, it's a tectonic response to the energy of a large impact like that. Don't we see something like that on the, on the moon with a straight wall? The impact was on the other side of the moon and just basically reflected all the way through the moon? I think that's been proposed. I don't know. In the case of the moon, uh, I don't know that the impact or impactor basin to form that is in the same size scaling. Because you're talking about a very, very big impact on a very small body that is able to disrupt it to, to the point to produce this, whereas the moon is a much bigger body. And it depends on which impactor they think. If it's related to South Pole Aitken, which is the biggest impact basin in the solar system, that's one thing. But if it's, if it's a smaller impact, I don't know that it would have that effect. But it's, yeah, it could have been proposed, yeah. Okay, anything else? Thanks again. Yeah, you're welcome.